oftentimes this is like the patient that's like found down in like a sex shop. And you find these patients who are, you know, maybe have the bluest discoloration. You go, ah, it's methemoglobin because they were doing poppers here. And unfortunately, uh, I guess us paramedics liked to to steal those and use those as poppers. And so what what they found was a bunch of their kits had been tampered with where they would put them out on the rig and it'd be a complete kit. And then they'd look back at it and all the amyl nitrite would be gone. Here you on eight. Here you on eight. Okay, you're clear. Stand by for your base. Welcome to EMS Cast, where we provide high-level education for you, the providers on the streets. Today, we have our toxicology fellow, Dr. Nick Matzler, joining us again to talk about some gases. I originally reached out to Nick to talk about cyanide because, you know, I think that is something that we may commonly see in the pre-hospital setting. And the only thing that I truly know about cyanide is house fires and their lactic acid level rises when I check it in the emergency department, maybe something about almonds too <laughs> in there. But when I reached out to Nick about this, he, he thought we should also talk about some other various gases, some gases that might be used in suicide, some gases that might be used in chemical warfare that kind of go together with this topic. And so I may regret asking him to come on to talk about all these things, but we're going to find out. So Nick, welcome back to the show. Uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to be back again. And I'm really excited to to get to dig in some of these topics that we actually may encounter uh, out in the field. So tell me why are all of these gases kind of important for us to at least have an understanding about uh, in case we do come across them in the field? That's a great question. I think a big reason why is that these are oftentimes gases that have important implications both for the patient and the provider. And what I mean by that is these are a true pre-hospital opportunity to intervene on a patient in which they might actually not do very well unless they get certain antidotes. And it's really going to be on the pre-hospital providers to recognize the signs and symptoms. And then very importantly, these are all gases that can often hurt the rescuers, hurt the providers that are showing up in the pre-hospital setting to try to rescue these patients. And so I think it's important not only to be able to recognize these symptoms so that you can save a patient's life, but more importantly, so that you keep yourself safe while you're trying to rescue these patients or to activate the ICS, the incident command structure, should you need to in case of a mass casualty incident. Where should we start? Uh, you know, how can the listener relate to this or where are our misunderstandings with regards to some of these? I, I think a really nice place to start would just be with cyanide itself. And then we can move into hydrogen sulfide or H2S, which is going to be treated very similar to the cyanide. And again, both these compounds are going to be an opportunity for the pre-hospital providers to not only save somebody's life, but keep themselves safe. And so I think this is a, a great place to start because they have very similar treatment. And then the other gases I was hoping to talk about are gases that are often used as chemical warfare agents or agents of terror. And I today I thought we'd limit it just to some of the agents that are very similar to the organophosphates uh, and that are all treated the same way. So we can talk about the differences between some of these gases, but then also at the end of the day arrive at, hey, they're going to look the same and you're going to treat them the same. Okay. So let's start with cyanide. When might we come across cyanide in the pre-hospital setting? So I think most pre-hospital providers are going to be really comfortable with the standard house fire. So, you know, you, you're called out to a house fire, firefighters bring out a patient to you who might be sick, uh, or they might look fairly well initially. And I think a lot of people that triggers a thought in their mind to say, I have to watch out for cyanide in this case, because I, I know it could be there. Now, of course, things like carbon monoxide are going to be produced. Other sorts of gases are going to be produced, but cyanide is insanely common, especially since most of the materials that we use to make couches and furniture and clothing, when they burn, unfortunately, they release cyanide gas. And so when you're trapped in a small enclosed space with stuff that's on fire, cyanide is going to be a big one of the toxicities that you need to watch out for, in addition to the regular garden variety stuff like carbon monoxide and other irritants. So when we talk about cyanide with regards to a, a house fire, I mean, I've seen a lot of patients pre hospitally and in the hospital who have been in a house fire and and I've rarely seen anybody with cyanide toxicity. What's the patient that I actually need to be worried about in that scenario? So the patient you're all looking for is the patient who turns out to get progressively sicker as as you are transporting them or as you're seeing them on scene or the patient that comes out to you that's immediately quite sick. Usually what it takes is for you to be truly trapped, truly in an enclosed space 
where you're taking, unfortunately, deep breaths of the gases that are floating around the room. So it usually takes a room to be fairly involved for there to be a, a reasonable amount of smoke available to be inhaled. And then as those patients are rescued from the environment, which is always going to be the first step in management for any of these gases, just get people away from the gases. As they're rescued from the environment, it's very important to see kind of what they look like initially and then how they evolve over time. So the common cyanide toxic patient comes in two flavors. One is the patient who is just out from the get-go. Like they're brought out, they're already unconscious. You get your first set of vitals and you're like, wow, this person's super sick. They're very hypotensive. They're very tachycardic. They may even be bradycardic by the time you see them. And that patient is already super, super sick. The other category of patients from house fires are ones that might come out and look reasonable. They might be coughing, clearly exposed to smoke and soot and things like that. And initially you might get a set of vitals and they're actually hypertensive and they're very tachycardic or even mildly tachycardic. And you might think to yourself, oh, this hypertension is just due to the stress of being in a house fire, which would be a, a very reasonable first thought to have. What's very interesting, though, is, is part of the way cyanide works is that when it starts initially poisoning your cells, your body's very smart and says, wait a minute, something is going wrong here. And so it just dumps all your catecholamines into your bloodstream. So in response to this kind of cellular poisoning that's happening, all of your norepi and epi and all these other neurotransmitters that are trying to increase your heart rate, increase your blood pressure, they just get dumped out of all these cells. And that does lead to some transient hypertension and tachycardia. So it's not unusual to first see a very cyanide toxic patient who may have some vague neuro symptoms that they're not quite acting right. They're a little altered. They're hypertensive and tachycardic. And then all of a sudden, over the next couple of minutes, all of a sudden their blood pressure starts dropping. Their heart rate might stay very tacky. They start to become more and more altered. And then all of a sudden you lead to this death spiral of refractory bradycardia and hypotension that cannot be treated any other way, essentially without an antidote. Hmm. Okay. So I'm looking out for the patient who was trapped in a burning building, specifically in a room that was likely involved with like lots of smoke. They were trapped in there for an extended period of time. And then they're either going to come out to me unconscious and sick appearing to begin with, or as I, as I watch them, they're going to become more confused, more tachycardic, hypotensive, and then eventually bradycardic and this death spiral we talk about. What's what's happening in that progression of that patient who comes out talking to me and then becomes more confused and vital signs become abnormal? Yeah. So what's happening deeper on, and I think it's worth talking about this mechanism, even though it might include way too much biochemistry. I think explaining how it works kind of helps understand how some of the antidotes work and what's going on in the patient. And so this is what we refer to as cellular asphyxia. So we're all used to like, hey, if I get choked or there's no oxygen in a room, I'm going to have regular asphyxia where I just am not getting any oxygen into my blood in the first place. This is what we call cellular asphyxia, which means that there's usually an abundant amount of oxygen in your uh, bloodstream, especially since people are often on non-rebreathers by this point, but the body can't use the oxygen. And since it can't use the oxygen, the cell itself is being asphyxiated. And to to drill into that a little bit more, specifically what's happening is that your mitochondria are being poisoned. So oftentimes people think of the mitochondria as like the powerhouse of the cell, which is exactly the right way to think about it, I think. you know, And it's really responsible for creating an enormous amount of ATP and allows us to do all the amazing things that we do uh, to have enough energy to grow as big as we do uh, and to do all these interesting things where we can burn a small amount of calories and run 10 miles. Really mitochondria is what do this all for us. Part of the mitochondria called the electron transport chain, or sometimes it's referred to as the respiratory chain. The reason it's called that is because as electrons are passed through the electron transport chain, where they eventually end up is oxygen. And so that's why we breathe in the first place, to, to get oxygen at least. When we get the oxygen, the oxygen serves as what we call a terminal electron acceptor. And really the take-home message is that there's a few different complexes within your mitochondria that pass electrons along. And as they pass electrons along, they make a chemical gradient that is eventually responsible for making all your ATP, to make all your energy. What cyanide does, uh, as well as some other toxins, is it blocks one of those complexes, specifically complex four. 
when you block that complex, it stops the ability of your body to utilize that oxygen as what we call the terminal electron acceptor. And as it blocks uh, that ability, you no longer can use your mitochondria to produce ATP. Since you no longer can use the mitochondria to produce ATP, you must rely so, uh, solely on glycolysis. And glycolysis, meaning breaking down glucose, sugar, that only makes you a little bit of ATP. It makes some other products that are shuffled into the mitochondria to eventually make a lot of ATP, but by glycolysis itself only makes a little bit of ATP. And your body at first says, okay, my mitochondria aren't working well. Complex is blocked. I've got plenty of oxygen, but still something else is going on. And so it just says, I still need energy. So I'm going to just run glycolysis faster. That pathway is still open to me. So I'm just going to run it as fast as I can. And for a little bit, meaning like minutes, spinning glycolysis that fast does result in some ATP production. So you still can do some things that you need to within the cell that require energy. You can still hold on a little bit. You can maintain a little bit. And it's during that period of time that your body is saying, wow, there's something really wrong going on with me. I need to try to raise my blood pressure and heart rate. So it starts dumping out a bunch of catecholamines. So for a little while in there, between the energy that you had left over, as well as kind of spinning glycolysis to make a little bit of ATP, you can respond to those catecholamines. You can raise your blood pressure. You can raise your heart rate. And so for a little bit, your body is able to maintain but as you deplete more of that stored ATP you have or the ATP that was available, as you spin glycolysis faster and you're still not keeping up with your energy demands, that's when you start entering this phase of or the cycle of death where you start becoming more and more hypotensive just because you literally don't have the energy to constrict your blood vessels. And then your heart rate starts going down because you just don't have the energy to, to continue to beat your heart. Each heartbeat gets weaker and weaker as you don't have enough energy to squeeze your heart. And it's all because that cyanide is blocking that, that last part of the mitochondrial chain there. Okay. Let me see if I understand that. So we require oxygen to efficiently produce ATP, which is essentially the energy within our body. If we don't have oxygen, we can only produce a few ATP. If we do have oxygen, we can produce maybe 10 times that and produce a lot more ATP and energy. What happens is cyanide poisons that mitochondria, that powerhouse, such that it can't utilize oxygen to make a bunch of ATP. So then we lose ATP, we have no more energy, our cells can't function properly. You're exactly right. And that's actually responsible for one of the interesting things that we'll see in the hospital. So in, in the hospital, we will actually see this phenomenon of people that look kind of cherry red in appearance, and we'll see an atrialization of the, the veins. And what that means is that, you know, we're used to veins being uh, more cyanotic, a little bit more blue in color because we think of them as not having a lot of oxygen. And people who are cyanide toxic, there's a ton of oxygen in the blood. Like their lungs are working great. You have a non-rebreather on them. You know, they have a ton of oxygen in their blood, but they can't use it. And so actually the venous side of things actually looks very arterial. So you kind of lose some of the coloration of the veins. And if you were to draw a blood gas sample from the right side of your heart, meaning, you know, the blood has gone all the way through your body and dropped off as much oxygen as it can, comes back to the right side of the heart. In somebody who's profoundly cyanide toxic, that oxygen saturation on the right side of the heart will not look that different from the oxygen saturation on the left side of the heart because the oxygen had nowhere to go. It, it wanted to unload and be used in cells, but there was no cells to use it. So it's still just hanging out in the bloodstream. Interesting. So what can we do? Is there something we can do to help or reverse or antidote this process? Yeah. And so the antidotes are very slick. And so I think first it'd be nice to talk about the old way we used to treat cyanide because there are still some pre-hospital systems out there that use some of these older antidotes. And then I think it'd be nice to talk about like the new and best treatment that we have available at least right now, which is hydroxycobalamin. So Part of the reason to bring up this whole problem with the mitochondria and, and where it works and all that kind of stuff is just to say that in the mite, like where cyanide targets, the reason cyanide targets that piece of the mitochondria is it's very attracted to iron. And you use iron in two big places in the body. I mean, there's tons more, but the two places to talk about today is iron used in the mitochondria and iron used in your red blood cells. And this may be going a little bit too in depth, but Iron in your red blood cells is often iron two plus. And the two plus, it refers to how many electrons are associated with that iron. So 
the two plus state, it means that there's two less electrons and there are protons, so it has a, a positive charge on it. In the mitochondria, we often see iron in the Fe3 plus state. Uh, so there's one less electron compared to what your hemoglobin normally looks like. And cyanide loves that. Cyanide loves to jump on to that Fe3 plus moiety and just sit there. And so one of the old ways to treat this is to actually induce methemoglobinemia. So methemoglobinemia is simply iron in your red blood cells instead of the two plus state that it wants to be in the normal red blood cell state. It's iron in the three plus state. That's all methemoglobin is, is just one more or less electron on your red blood cell. And so things like sodium nitrite or amyl nitrite are ways that you can actually induce met hemoglobin in these patients. And so you can imagine if all the cyanide in your blood that you either inhaled or gotten to another way goes and attacks your mitochondria because it likes the Fe3 plus state. If you can just take your red blood cell and make it Fe3 plus, then you can kind of coax it out of the cell. You can be like, hey, look, here's this, here's exactly where you want to bind, but it's in a red blood cell. And it goes, oh, great. I'll leave the mitochondria and I'll jump on the red blood cell. Now, cyanide attached to your red blood cell doesn't doesn't really matter. It's not really that toxic for you. Yes, it is absolutely impairing your ability to transport oxygen, but not every one of your red blood cells is going to be attached to a cyanide. You're still going to have plenty usually that can transport oxygen in the normal way, but you can pull it off the mitochondria and put it onto the red blood cell. So that's kind of what we want. So the old school kits used to have three parts to it. It used to have amyl nitrite, sodium nitrite, and sodium thiosulfate. And to talk about them, we'll separate sodium thiosulfate off from the first two for just for a second. So to just focus on amyl nitrite and sodium nitrite, these drugs, all they really do is induce methemoglobin in your patient. And the reason there was two different flavors is amyl nitrate is available as like a little ampule that you would like break in half or you would crush. And then the patient would sniff it. They would inhale it. And as they inhaled it, that would cause methemoglobinemia to be formed and start rescuing the patient. The sodium nitrite is available as an IV preparation. And so if you had an IV in a patient, you could start it that way. And the reason they had both of these in the kits was because in a cyanide toxic patient who is hypotensive and bradycardic, it may be very difficult to find good access on the patient. And especially before the advent of IOs, it was even more of an issue if you couldn't get access on a patient. And so the amyl nitrate was included in these kits so that you could crush them and you could kind of wave them underneath the patient's nose, they would inhale it and they would start to be treated. And as they started to be treated, maybe some veins would pop up or at least temporize them enough where you could get some veins. And then if you decided they needed more methemoglobin, you could give them more of the nitrite. If, the, if you thought they had plenty around, then you would start treatment with the sodium thiosulfate that we'll talk about here in a second. Unfortunately, what happened was that, uh, you know, you all may know amyl nitrite uh, and similar compounds under a different name, which is poppers. So you may have picked up a patient from uh, oftentimes this is like the patient that's like found down in like a sex shop. Uh, and you find these patients who are, you know, maybe have the bluest discoloration. You go, ah, it's met hemoglobin because they were doing poppers here. And unfortunately, uh, I guess us paramedics liked to to steal those and use those as poppers. And so what what they found was a bunch of their kits had been tampered with where they would put them out on the rig and it'd be a complete kit. And then they'd look back at it and all the amyl nitrite would be gone and only the, the sodium nitrite and, and thiosulfate was left. So the original kit had all three. The, the, the newer kits after that just had the two components, the sodium nitrite and the uh, sodium thiosulfate so that uh, the paramedics would stop stealing them uh, <laughs> overall for their own uh, personal use. Wow. <laughs> we'll, we'll probably need to do an, uh, its own episode on poppers and, uh, and the history of paramedics stealing and using <laughs> poppers. But just quickly to connect that for anybody who doesn't know, what's the draw of recreational using a popper? So poppers in general uh, typically make people feel like a little bit lightheaded and kind of give them like a euphoric or high sensation. It also is a pretty potent vasodilator. Uh, it makes some nitric oxide. And to not be uh, too in-depth, other medications that somebody might consider that do a similar thing would be medications like Viagra. Uh, and so this is why they're sold where I mentioned they're sold. And this is why you might see them uh, available, why people might consume them recreationally. 
Fair enough. All right. <laughs> Bring it back out of the sex shops. Um, so you talked about methemoglobinemia and just a, a quick wrap on that. So methemoglobinemia is an abnormality with your red blood cells where the iron state, like you talked about, goes from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, and it prevents the binding of oxygen. So now as I'm hearing you talking, I'm realizing that in order for oxygen to be able to be bound it, or to be useful in a, in our blood, it A, needs iron and needs to be bound to iron. And B, that iron needs to be Fe2 plus, not Fe3 plus. And so what happens in met hemoglobinemia, oftentimes drugs, sometimes genetic disorders, cause this iron to go from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. Oxygen can no longer bind to the red blood cells, and you get kind of this cyanotic appearance when you put them on the pulse ox, they have low oxygen levels, and we could do this justice on its own episode. But I'm now connecting this that you can actually induce this state to trick the cyanide out of the mitochondria onto the red blood cells. And then you can give the patient a bunch of oxygen and the oxygen can attach to red blood cells, but it can actually dissolve in your blood. And then as it dissolves just into your blood can actually get into your cells and be used by the mitochondria and whatnot. Uh, that, that's exactly right. And I think that's a really nice, succinct description of it all. And I think part of what we're both kind of dancing around is like, uh, Ross is giving me crazy looks like, wait a minute, man, you want me to take a patient who is already hypotensive and tachycardic, who also has carbon monoxide poisoning from the fire. And you want me to poison their red blood <laughs> cells and make them more hypotensive with, with the amyl nitrate and sodium nitrate. And, and the answer is yes. Uh, but, uh, it's all a numbers game. Like let's say hundred percent of your red blood cells are working before the fire. You go into this fire and now your concentration of carbon monoxide is 25%. Okay, 25% of your red blood cells aren't working anymore. Uh, and then I give you sodium nitrite or amyl nitrite to induce the methemoglobin to try to rescue you from cyanide. And now I take out another 25% of your red blood cells. Well, 50% of working red blood cells is still a reasonable amount to still carry enough oxygen. And as you pointed out, we can still dissolve some oxygen in the blood to help it transport to the different areas in the body that need to use the oxygen. And so it's all a numbers game. If we made a hundred percent of your red blood cells met hemoglobin, it, it would absolutely kill you. Uh, and we, we would not be able to save you from that, but it's all about giving enough to poison enough red blood cells to deal with the other poison that's killing you faster, but not poison you so badly as to actually kill you. And so it's a fine line that you're walking there uh, when you're trying to give some of these antidotes, there are some other purported benefits to, uh, sodium nitrite and amyl nitrate. It increases with its vasodilation. It increases some blood for the liver and in the liver is where a lot of our enzymes that detoxify cyanide are. And so there are some proposed mechanisms by just improving blood flow to the liver with some of these, uh, agents that we are actually helping to detoxify the cyanide further. So it is, uh, a antidote that is not without downside, but is an antidote that may be able to save somebody's life if that's all you have available. And when we start talking about hydroxycobalamin in a minute, you're going to see why it is a far superior yeah. antidote yeah. to anything else. So we're not necessarily treating an overdose with an overdose, but we're treating a poisoning with a poisoning. Yeah. Uh, which sounds like a dangerous game to play, which is why we came up with a better antidote. But quickly, why is it important? Why did we just talk about all this? Why is it important for our listeners to still know about these medications? we still see these used in some places. And, you know, when I was a paramedic, uh, actually, I remember during my training, they taught us about how to use these uh, cyanide antidote kits that had the amyl nitrate and sodium nitrate and sodium thiosulfate. But they were all like, yeah, man, but there's like hydroxycobalamin is starting to come out on the rigs and it's going to be like this new big thing. So some of the systems out there might still use these antidotes. So it's important to use the other important thing about it is you might get a patient who's been given these antidotes. So for example, I get calls occasionally from areas where they do mining work because mines are where cyanide salts are often used, like uh, potassium cyanide and sodium cyanide. They're used in the mining industry. And the people that work with them usually wear very special uh, like precautions and they know what they're working with and they make sure they're not going to be cyanide toxic. But accidents, of course, happen. So every now and again, somebody will be exposed to cyanide in one of these sites. A lot of these mining sites apparently have, this is what they have. They have like amyl nitrate poppers available to give to people and sometimes some sodium thiosulfate hanging out. And so I have gotten a few calls uh, in my tox life uh, 
from folks that say, hey, I've got this patient who was exposed to cyanide at the mine they work at, and they were started on treatment with amyl nitrate. Can I still give hydroxycobalamin is, uh, is one of the questions I got asked. And so it's just important to know that not only uh, if you still use these, you should know how to use them so you can rescue somebody. But if you don't use these, if you get a patient, uh, if you end up riding out there, because it was actually the the medical staff that was on site at the mine that was administering these, and then they handed care off to a paramedic who then took them to the hospital and continued to treat them in route. And so it's important to know about these because you might get handed a patient someday that they say, hey, by the way, we already initiated treatment with uh, these two antidotes on scene. And what is the answer there? Do you still give hydroxycobalamin? Yes. So the easy answer there is you can still give hydroxycobalamin. You still might want to give hydroxycobalamin depending on what you see. The, the other piece that we haven't quite talked about is the sodium thiosulfate piece. And the only reason that's important to bring up is that there's a special enzyme in your body called rhodonese. And rhodonese, the enzyme, all it does is it takes cyanide and it adds a sulfur onto it. And thiol is just a, a Greek chemical combining form for uh, sulfur. So if you see a thiol group, it just means there's a sulfur moiety there. And so sodium thiosulfate is just a bunch of sulfur. And so when you give it to somebody, the sulfur doesn't do much harm to a patient, but it provides rhodonese, which a bunch of sulfur that it can transfer onto the cyanide. And once you put sulfur onto cyanide, it's no longer toxic. Uh, the body can pee it out and you're totally fine from that component. And so we would give sodium thiosulfate because the rate limiting step for rhodonese, the enzyme, what was holding it back is not enough sulfur donors. So you quickly exhaust your own sulfur donors in your own body. And so if you can give a bunch of sulfur donors, uh, meaning the sodium thiosulfate stuff, you can let that enzyme run faster and faster. So your own body can detoxify cyanide all on its own. And in fact, there's there's no better case studies in this than in certain parts of the world uh, that, that especially eat cassava, uh, the root. Uh, cassava is a root that has a lot of cyanogenic compounds in it. And so a cyanogenic compound is a compound that will be metabolized into cyanide in the body. And so cassava has something called linamarin in it, which is a compound that in the gut, the bacteria will turn it into cyanide. And so in places in the world that eat a lot of cassava as like their main staple food, what they have to do is they have to wash the plant. And if you soak the plant for a couple of days, about 90% of the cyanogenic compound leaves the root. Uh, but some of it still remains. And when people eat it, they do just fine. And that's because we have an enzyme that can detoxify a little bit of cyanide. During droughts, when they can't soak the root as much as they want, they end up getting more of the cyanide. And they don't become usually fully toxic where it kills them instantly. It just poisons them over time where they get this like chronic exposure to cyanide and they end up with all sorts of neuropathies and other like horrible medical conditions. But it just is a, a good demonstration of how our body is equipped to deal with cyanide, but it just doesn't have enough of the substrates that it needs, like enough of the sulfur, for example, to take care of big hits of cyanide. So when you get a bunch of cyanide all at once, if we can give you some of those substrates like the sodium thiosulfate, then we can provide rhodonese with enough of the building blocks to put together to detoxify the cyanide rapidly. So why do we use hydroxycobalamin now instead of sodium thiosulfate? Hmm. That's a great question. A lot of it has to do with how effective it is and how easy it is. So again, like, I mean, we spend a lot of time now talking about how you're going to give amyl nitrite, sodium nitrite, you know, induce met hemoglobin, try to get somebody a little bit better and then give them sodium thiosulfate on top of that to try to, you know, further detoxify them. That's a bunch of steps. And inducing met hemoglobin is kind of a guessing game where you're like, ah, have I induced enough? Not enough. Like, where am I in terms of this patient? Hydroxycobalamin is a one and done. Well, not quite, but it's, I give five grams, patient should get better. Uh, and so you just give them the entire vial, which usually comes as five grams, and that's it. There's no other like steps necessary. You don't have to induce met hemoglobin. You don't have to do anything else. You just give them one antidote and it should work real well. It's really interesting. The way hydroxycobalamin works is, again, it's kind of coaxing cyanide out of the mitochondria. It is a very attractive looking moiety that says, oh yes, cyanide, please come bind with me. As soon as cyanide comes and binds with it, it goes from hydroxycobalamin to cyanocobalamin. And the other name for cyanocobalamin is vitamin B12. Uh, 
And so really you're just kind of helping somebody by giving them a little extra vitamins uh, after they detoxify their own cyanide. The, the other nice thing about it is that hydroxycobalamin actually scavenges nitric oxide on its own. And kind of as we alluded to earlier, nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator. And so one of the side effects of hydroxycobalamin is increased blood pressure. And in somebody who's dying of refractory hypotension in front of you, well, a little bit of increased blood pressure is kind of a, a very reasonable thing in that patient. And so it's really nice because as this patient is getting sicker and sicker, you give them an antidote that is going to be super effective, uh, both in, in terms of it being able to bind to the cyanide. And then at the same time, it actually has some side effects that are beneficial to it as well, like increasing your blood pressure in somebody who's already very, very hypotensive. We talked about this a little bit, but outside of your house fires, where else might you see this cyanide poisoning? Yeah. So cyanide is actually used in a lot of different industries. So we, we mentioned the mining industry where a lot of the sodium and potassium cyanide salts are used, but it's also used in plastic manufacturing, in uh, photo and photographic development it's used in metallurgy, it's used in plastics manufacturing, uh, as well as fumigation. So you can really find cyanide like all over the place in industry. And so especially if you're getting toned out to a patient who you're picking up from uh, like a large industrial area who's sick, talking to people about what exposures they might've had is important in those cases too, and might clue you into, oh, whoops, maybe this person got toxic from something like cyanide. I also went on my quick rant about uh, the cyanogenic compounds that are found in cassava. Actually, you can find cyanogenic compounds in a lot of different things too. So uh, some of the things that might uh, be surprising is the seeds of like apples, peaches, apricots, bitter almonds, cherries, they all have something called amygdalin. And amygdalin is very similar to linamarin, just meaning that amygdalin is a cyanogenic compound. And all that means is that it has a cyanide moiety somewhere in it. Normally, it's not going to do anything to you, but if you eat it and you eat enough of it, your gut bacteria will actually process this amygdalin stuff found in all these seeds to cyanide and you'll become toxic. And so a lot of people think, well, if I ingest a bunch of cyanide or I inhale a bunch of cyanide, I should die right away. And you're totally right. You should. Uh, but <laughs> if you eat uh, these cyanogenic compounds like amygdalin, you might not get sick for several hours. You might be totally fine. And then hours and hours later, your body is finally biotransformed enough of the amygdalin into cyanide that now you start becoming toxic. And occasionally at the poison center, we see people who have researched online, like how to harm themselves. And some of these websites will talk about, Hey, if you get these seeds and especially if you crush them, uh, like if you eat the whole seed, you're probably fine. But if you crush them and you eat a lot of them, you might get pretty cyanide toxic. And then you might need to be treated. And so sometimes, you know, you may not realize that what they've done is actually something that can harm them hours down the road. The other really funny one too is nitrile. Uh, so like uh, acetonitrile, acryl nitrile, proprio nitrile, so like nitrile gloves, those are cyanogenic compounds. So if you eat your gloves, you, you could potentially get sick hours later if you're using nitrile gloves. So I shouldn't be eating the gloves on the rig? I wouldn't necessarily okay. recommend All right. it. All right. Good to know. <laughs> Good to know. There's, there's also some very famous historical cases there in the 80s. Unfortunately, a handful of people died from uh, just Tylenol acetaminophen tablets that had been tampered with and somebody had added cyanide to them. So people, unfortunately, who just had headaches took Tylenol and then died from cyanide toxicity, which was very... Uh, horrific, but they also introduced legislation for tamper resistant packaging because of those deaths. And so now that now the all the packaging that all our food and medicines come in that's tamper resistant is because of cyanide and cyanide toxicity. Of course, cyanide has been used in warfare as well. And so it was used by Napoleon uh, as one of the like earliest uh, uses of these kinds of warfare agents. It was used in World War One as a gas. And then unfortunately in World War II, uh, it was one of the main methods of execution for the Nazis to carry out their atrocities and genocide against the Jews. Uh, and so it's, it's a cyanide is a very important compound that's been with us for a long time. It was also how Jim Jones and his cult uh, committed suicide in the uh, flavor aid. It wasn't actually, uh, it wasn't actually Kool-Aid. It was flavor aid. Kool-Aid's okay. been smeared for a long time. Uh, so like, poor Kool -Aid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So really it's flavor aid that should get all the hate, but, uh, uh, they also use cyanide. So it's a very important 
poison within our history, not just one that we'll still encounter. Okay. So now we've, we've come across the patient who was either trapped in a burning building or in a mining accident or took a bunch of seeds in an attempt to harm themselves. What is our trigger for treating this patient with our antidote hydroxycobalamin? Yeah. And I think this is the most important point to bring up. The trigger to do it is if you are concerned at all about cyanide toxicity. The problem is that even when you bring somebody to the hospital, there is no rapid way to prove that they are cyanide toxic. So we can send blood concentrations of cyanide, but it's very difficult to test for. And even if I sent a blood test for it, it would take days before it came back. So the patient's going to die or live long before that test ever comes back. And there is no other definitive test I can use. There's nothing else I can do to say, oh yes, for sure this is cyanide and not some other compound that we're worried about. And so you have to just maintain a high clinical index of suspicion. So in the scenarios you listed out, like any of these things where they're exposed to the gases, to the burning buildings, manufacturing, anywhere that you reasonably think there's cyanide and you have a patient that is sick in front of you, meaning altered, hypotensive, that patient should just receive the antidote. And you shouldn't feel bad about it. I feel like sometimes in medicine, there is... There's the activation energy you need just to do something that you think you need to do, but it's hard because the patient otherwise is looking fairly reasonable. So you might get somebody out of a house fire and you're like, yeah, they're a little hypotensive and altered, but they, ah, you know, could this be carbon monoxide? Let me put them on a non rebreather Let me start a line. Let me start giving them some fluids. We're starting to drive to the hospital. And they're like, ah, do they really need an antidote? If you're ever on the fence about it, please let me be the voice in your head just to say, give it. You have the permission to use hydroxycobalamin or any of your antidotes to try to save somebody's life if you're worried that they're toxic. If somebody has normal vital signs or just some minor tachycardia, but they're pretty with it, that's somebody I think you can reasonably observe. And if they decompensate in the 15 minutes you're driving them to the hospital, then absolutely you should light them up and give them that antidote. Uh, but if they're already sick when you get to them, you should just be giving the antidote. Some people will talk about like, well, what, what's the downsides? Like why not just treat anybody I'm worried about? People often worry about what you're doing to blood work tests. You may have heard about this, that like uh, if you ever have seen hydroxycobalamin, I encourage you to look at it on your rigs and things like that, but it's a very deep red color. And that color stains everything, like everything. And in fact, people that get hydroxycobalamin, even in smaller doses than we give, may have reddish discoloration of their urine, tears, sweat, uh, for sometimes weeks after you give it. So uh, they can have all this discoloration. That obviously doesn't matter. You're like, you can warn somebody, hey, you, you might, if you cry, cry some red tears for a while, which might be disconcerting if you didn't warn them. But, you know, that's no big deal. But it could be a Catholic miracle. Could be a miracle. That's right. Stigmata right there. Uh, but the, the issue sometimes people bring up is that a lot of the tests we do in the hospital are based on what we call colorimetric assays. So they're assays that we rely on a color change to interpret whether they're positive, negative, and to what degree they're positive or negative. So the best example I can give you off the top of my head is creatinine. So creatinine, we the color changes, we measure the color, and based off the color, we say your creatinine is X, Y, or Z. Well, if you give somebody hydroxycobalamin, I can no longer accurately measure their creatinine is if I use a colorimetric creatinine test. And that goes for any test that use a colorimetric assay to determine it. And so some ER docs might wrongly get mad at you for giving hydroxycobalamin to a borderline patient because they'll be like, oh my gosh, you've ruined all my blood tests for days. I'm not going to know what's going on with this patient. And, and that is not the right attitude. So if you ever get grief about that, you can just smile and nod and walk away knowing that you still did the right thing and, and just don't worry about that doctor. Uh, because ultimately it, it doesn't matter what their lab tests are. It matters whether they're alive or not and whether you kept them safe or not. And so sometimes I hear people that have either been yelled at about that kind of an issue in the past, or they know about that issue and they're just worried, ah, am I going to mess up these lab tests? And now the docs are going to have a harder time figuring out what's going on. Do not worry about that. Just treat them with the antidote hydroxycobalamin and ensure that they're safe. And then we can figure it out on the back end because there's lots of slick ways to order different flavors of lab tests or do different things that aren't colorimetric based. So we can still get some answers from people. It's much more important that you treat them up front. Good to know. So a patient who has the history of exposure and then the vital sign or mental abnormalities that make you concerned that they are sick. The patient with history of exposure and a sick patient, that triggers treatment. 
that's perfect. That's the exact right way to think about it because we just don't want you to watch somebody who's hypotensive and potentially getting worse all the way to the hospital just because you're worried about giving the antidote. The important thing is just to give it if you are have high clinical suspicion, which is exactly the, the scenario you just laid out. Great. And then a patient who may be a little tachycardic, but normal blood pressure, normal mentation, you can watch them for a trend. And if you start to see their trend, their blood pressure becomes hypotensive, they become altered, trigger, give the medication. You're exactly right. And that's part of the reason I brought up kind of the abnormalities and vital signs in the very beginning, meaning that sometimes these people will initially be hypertensive and tachycardic before they get real sick. Because if you pull somebody out from the fire, you're monitoring them really keep a close eye on their blood pressure, especially if they were hypertensive to begin with, because it within five to 10 minutes, you might see them going from a little altered, but, but pretty reasonable vitals for what you see. You might be like, ah, yeah, this guy might have underlying hypertension. So blood pressure 160, I don't care about right now. And then over the next five to 10 minutes, oh, oops, now all of a sudden they're, they're going down in terms of their heart rate and their blood pressure. And you should, some people would be like, well, does that make sense for cyanide? And it does like, that is exactly the natural history of it. And so watch those people closely, even if they start dropping over 10, 15 minutes of transport, still treat them with the hydroxycobalamin. That's a good point that we should talk about. So you talked about with the seeds, it may take a few hours for those to be metabolized by your gut bacteria and then turned into cyanide before you come sick. What about the other methods of exposure, like inhalation from a fire? What's the timeline we would expect to see that cyanide toxicity take place and see those abnormalities? That's a really important question. The The easiest way to answer it is that it really depends on the concentration of gas in the air. So like if you're in an industrial setting or a fire, depending on how high the amount of cyanide in the air is, it might take longer or shorter before you get sick and die. And so if there's a high amount of cyanide in the air, which we usually expect from like house fires or certain industrial applications, if you take a few breaths, you're going to get pretty sick pretty fast. And so from an inhalational route, as long as there was a sufficient concentration of gas in the air, you should get sick pretty darn quick. So we're talking within minutes, certainly not much more than like 15, 20 minutes. So if you pulled somebody out from a fire and they had inhaled some cyanide, but now it's 30 minutes later and their their vitals still look pretty good, I have a lower suspicion that they're going to go on to get worse. They still might, but more often than not, they're probably going to start heading in the right direction. Their liver is going to naturally detoxify any cyanide that was there and they're probably going to be safe. Still somebody you should watch closely. So inhalation is usually very quick. Just like you said, if it's ingestion of something that needs to be transformed, so if it's your nitrile gloves, if it's your, you know, uh, I I blended up 100 apple seeds and ate them or whatever, those people are going to have a much more variable presentation where it might take hours before they get sick, maybe even up to 24 hours until they get sick. And then uh, there's people that eat uh, cyanide that is more like the uh, cyanide salts, like potassium cyanide or uh, sodium cyanide those people tend to usually get sick within 20 or 30 minutes. So like ingestion of cyanide itself or inhalation usually makes you sick up front. Ingestion of things that need to be biotransformed into cyanide like seeds or cassava or nitrile or any of these kinds of things usually take longer before you get sick. So it's good to know that, you know, if somebody's called you and said, well, Earlier today, I tried to harm myself by blending a bunch of apricot seeds and eating them. They might look great in front of you. They might decomp in the back of your ambulance, or they might decomp the next day. Uh, So it's just somebody that has to be watched for a long time. Anything else we need to know or be aware of with cyanide? Well, I think those are a lot of the highlights overall. It's just have a high clinical index of suspicion and remember to keep yourself safe uh, above anything else in some of these exposures. You can also, one thing I forgot to mention is you can absorb cyanide through your skin in limited amounts. And so if somebody has cyanide powder on them or a salt to contain cyanide, you want to brush it off their skin. uh, And ideally, uh, you want to be in fully uh, protective equipment. Ideally, it would be like an SCBA because cyanide salts tend to react with water and produce gas right away. And so you want somebody who can decon the patient for you who is fully protected and then they can hand them off to you and you'll be safe. If somebody was just pulled out of a house fire, you you are not going to get exposed to cyanide because all that gas is left in the house. It's really that just the folks usually in like mining or or, uh, photographic equipment and things like that, if they get it on their skin, they can absorb some of it. You're going to want to make sure it's off before you get them in the back of your ambulance. 
in a few sentences with minimal mentions to chemical structures, can you just uh, wrap up cyanide poisoning for us and summarize this? I, I, I'm going to give it a shot here. You know, my, uh, love of going too deep. Uh, so I'm going to try to try to try to break it down as basic as I can. So the patients you should be worried about are patients that are coming from places where there was burning anything, um, because almost anything can create cyanide gas or industrial applications or mining applications. Usually people are going to let you know cyanides around there, but getting a patient that was exposed to something you suspect of cyanide they can initially be hypertensive and tachycardic. They will eventually develop hypotension and bradycardia that's refractive. And if you have a patient, as you very well pointed out earlier, in the right clinical scenario, meaning you have any suspicion for cyanide and they are sick in front of you, you should treat them with the antidote. And in most cases, that's going to be hydroxycobalamin. Thank you so much, Nick. That, this was a fascinating topic about cyanide poisoning and a lot of great information there for, for both myself and our listeners. I think... We've run on a little bit here, so I know you want to talk about some other gases, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to pause here. We're going to end this episode for this week, and our next episode coming out, we're going to talk about those other gases you wanted to chat about, okay? I think that sounds perfect, Ross. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, how long was that? That was about an hour. Oh, shit. Really? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah.